thank you for joining the afternoon session. That will be that will start with a discussion about uh, impact evaluation and impact evaluation of something very specific, which is investor impact and not investee impact. And we will make a very uh, crucial distinction between those two concepts. But to start my, so it will be a kind of lecture for uh, the whole of it should last one hour, but there will, will be for sure room for question and answers. So I don't know, I will speak, let's say for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Uh, so I will start by saying that within the impact landscape, there is clearly uh, an impact paradox. There is an impact paradox because on, on the one hand, uh, if you look at definitions of uh, impact investing, in most cases, you will see that measurement is a cornerstone of it, the same way as intentionality and additionality. So me measurement seems to be key when you propose an impact product. But in practice, when we look at current impact products, we do not see any trace of investor impact measurement. So people say measurement is key for doing impact finance or doing impact investing. But when we look in details to the marketing documents of the so-called impact products, you will not see any trace of impact measurement for investor impact, I mean, which is a problem. It's a problem because uh, investor impact would be very useful for providing information for impact motivated investors that want to know which product, which impact product to choose and how to compare different so-called impact products uh, within each other. Second, it would be useful for limiting impact washing. So the tendency to say you're doing impact, but in practice, you're not doing impact. It's only claims, misleading claims. Third, it would be useful as well for just complying with consumer protection law that basically says that you have to substantiate all your claims, including de facto impact claims. And perhaps it will be very soon uh, necessary to comply with the financial regulation because you will see in the next slide that the regulators are starting thinking about how to regulate those so-called impact products. And measurement may be part of it, may be part of the prerequisites for being called an impact product. And finally, for, for the products and funds that really want to be impact products, they need those type of measurements to check if their impact policy is successful, to check whether it is effective to deli in delivering impact. So it can be considered as an impact uh, management tool for uh, an impact risk management tool, I would say. So there are many reasons to introduce impact measurement within the scope of impact products. But so far, nothing is done by the industry, which is a problem. Uh, as I said before, regulation are starting to think about regulating impact products. And a very recent paper, consultation paper by the FCA was introducing the possibility of three different sustainable labels for financial products. And one of them was a sustainable impact products. And for that sustainable impact product, there was different qualifying criteria. And one of them was that those products should rely on a robust method to measure and demonstrate that its investment activities have had a positive environmental and or social sustainability impact. And I insist, it mentioned its own investment activities, not the activities of the invested companies, which make a big, big difference. So perhaps in a few years, there will be a regulation in France or the UK or the US that will consider that to be called a sustainable impact or impact product, you have to provide a robust method to evaluate your own impact. So it may come soon. But so far, as I said before, it's not measured. What is measured in the best case scenarios are invest investees outputs, or investee outcomes and quasi never investees impact and for sure never investor impact. So there are, let's say you have to go through different steps to reach investor impact measurements. And so far uh, we are just uh, stopping at the very beginning of the measurement uh, journey, I would say. 
So uh, if you go through impact reports, you will see most of the time uh, disclosure of information about investi outputs. Let's say the number of electric cars that were produced by the, the car company that was financed by the fund last year. Okay, that's the investi output. Perhaps you will also have probably the avoided emissions thanks to those electric cars, which is investi outcomes. But you will not have investi impact, which, which has to be measured against the counterfactual. So uh, I could explain this, but outcome is not exactly impact. Impact is outcome minus the counterfactual. So what would have happened otherwise, let's say if, you're in the, if the investi had not existed. So that's a new step. And the final step is your own investor impact, which is what would have happened uh, it's uh, the actual outcomes minus what would have happened if you had not financed the investing. That's the final step. That's the step we may, uh, we should have according to certain ways of thinking about impact. So it's definitely missing. So I, wanna, I want all of you to be clear about the distinction between investor and investing impacts. Investing impact is the change to the world that is made by the activities of a company, let's say. Investor impact is a change to the world that is due to the actions of an investor, an action on the investees. Okay, so every time you're thinking about your impact, the impact of uh, Monsieur Durand or Mrs. Dupont, you have to think what happens with that person included minus uh, an hypothetical world in which that person or that activity had not existed. You have to make that mental exercise. That is the impact thinking. And some people say that uh, you can switch from investing impact to investor impact pretty easily. And it was part of the discussion we had this morning during the panel, but it's not true. Uh, at least for many researchers, it's not true. For some people still claim that, but many people say it's, it's impossible to, to, to think that way. So some people say that if you own 10% of the company, mechanically, you own 10% of the impact of the company. But it doesn't fit with the definition of impact because impact is about making a change. So how do you make a change when you just invest in a company, let's say through secondary markets, in which you have just purchased the, the, the securities that were already owned by someone else? It's just an exchange, a trade between two people. Where is the change for the, for the society or the environment? I cannot see any change when it's done in secondary markets. And even more, in primary markets, we had that kind of uh, dispute with uh, Edouard from TKO. It's also the same uh, for primary markets. If the investment would have been made by someone else with no doubt in the positive impacts invested company, then how can you claim impact in that case? And even worse, probably that leads to negative impacts. It's not zero, it's negative. Uh, that has been discussed in different uh, theoretical models, but think of, uh, to me, what Edward was saying was very close to being a, a conventional investor. But if, let's say, uh, Edward is very motivated to deliver impact, let's say. And is financing a very profitable company that could have attracted funds by uh, capital by other conventional investors. He's taking a seat. He's taking the, the, the seat of that person. So you can say it's zero, zero sum game. No, 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 it's not zero sum game. Because if Edouard takes the seat, then the, the conventional investor has more money to allocate to another company, right? And if the other investor is conventional, is not impact motivated, it was probably reallocate to a non-positive impact company. But Edward, that is an impact motivated investor. If it had not been into this one, it would have allocated to another positive impact company. So it's not a zero sum game in that case. It's a negative sum game. So when uh, an impact motivated investor takes the seat of a conventional investor, the net impact is probably negative. That has been defended by researchers in theoretical models. So um, not everybody that is claiming to have impact does have positive impact. That's 
But to just to be clear, uh, don't go mechanically from investor impact to investor impact. It's not mechanical. You always have to think about the, the change you're making through your own actions. Uh, but still, some people claim that way, especially the GIN, the Global Impact Investing Network. They push forward for that kind of uh, impact accounting, but it doesn't fit with the definition of impact at all. So uh, consider that there are two ways to calculate impact so far in, within the industry. One is additionality based. One is more about proportional attribution, I would say. So uh, just to, for you to be clear about what is investor impact, let's take a very simple case. You invest directly into a company. So your impact will be based on the concept of additionality based on your own actions. So your impact will be the change in the invested company's own impact due to the change in the companies that are associated to your own investment. Okay, let's, that is pretty simple. But it gets more complicated when you intermediate the relationship between the investor and the investee through a product. In that case, you could think at three le different levels. Investee level, product level, investor level. And I know it's very counterintuitive, but you can invest in a positive impact financial product without having a positive investor impact. It happens uh, very often when you invest uh when you buy let's say share a share of a fund in the secondary market and it's not an open end fund it's a closed end fund so you're just buying a share of the fund from someone else so you do not make the fund grow so you do not create additionality at the level of the fund and as a as a consequence that cannot create any additionality at the level of the uh, investments of the funds so again, every time you have to think in terms of additionality, do you make a change? And sometimes when you invest in financial products, even if they have some positive impact, you don't have a positive impact because there is no additionality involved. So that's uh, for, uh, let's say, an intermediate case of investments. So, uh, so, so far, uh, so that's for the definitions to be clear to all of, all of us. But still, there is the, those, this impact paradox. So how, how can we make sense of the paradox? When you discuss the absence of impact measurements to, let's say, professionals of the industry, they come to you with three typical arguments. First one uh, is not feasible. It's impossible to measure uh, investor impact. Too complex, additionality is a nightmare. Okay. Second one is useless. In impact investors, they don't care about impact measurement. They want just impact so they don't want the proof of impact the evidence for impact they just want us to deliver impact so why should we spend money on the measurement thing we should more spend money on the action thing like uh, spending money on engagement for instance because engagement is costly so it's better to have uh, human resources devoted to engagement policy than having human resources devoted to measurements that's acceptable uh, on paper at least and finally, argument three, that uh, even, if it, it, even if it were feasible or use and useful, uh, the impact measurement would be too costly. It's, uh, and perhaps investors will not be uh, willing to pay for the measurement. Okay, let's, let's dig into this to see if it makes sense. Third, uh, first one, investor impact measurement is not feasible. But when they say that, the financial professionals, it's like they don't know about the whole history of impact evaluation. Impact evalu evaluation is not new at all. There have been like 20 years of impact evaluation within the realm of public policy, philanthropy, or social business. And if you are very into this, if you love impact measurement as a topic, that's a perfect gift for Christmas. Impact evaluation in practice by the World Bank, fifth. 500 pages on impact evaluation. All methods are in there. 500 pages, first edition, 2012, second edition, 2016. So if financial professionals in 2022 say it's not feasible, perhaps because they didn't read that book. And this is not the only book. There are plenty of impact evaluation and there are uh, uh, evaluation societies. There are evaluation journals. So if you want to know more about evaluation techniques, 
you have a lot to read and it's accessible, even enjoyable, I would say. Pleasurable, Dave, pleasurable. Uh, so uh, not feasible, not sure, because there are a lot of techniques that do exist. We know them. The only question remaining, is it applicable to finance? Because finance is not exactly the same as public policy. It's not exactly the same as social business. So uh, the topic is different. So maybe the methods have to be adapted. That could make sense. But still, before saying no, we have to dig into it to check if it's applicable or not. Second uh, argument, uh, it's useless because investors don't care. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, we have just run a survey of over 6,000 people in six uh, European countries. And one of the questions asked was about the, the dimension that should be part of any impact fund so that the fund will not be misleading to people. And we pro proposed different uh, uh, answers. One answer was about intentionality only. An impact fund would be a fund that has the intention to deliver impact only. Is it enough for you to uh, accept that uh, an impact fund would be like this? Second option, it's about intentionality plus actions. Is, do, is wanting to deliver impact plus is doing relevant actions to do that. Let's say engagement, flexible capital, etc. That was the second option. And the third option was the whole of it. Intention plus actions plus measure the impacts. And as you can see, it was split across those different answers, but most of people pre wanted all of it. Like they wanted the, a clear intentionality, clear actions, and clear measurements. So I'm not sure people don't want it. So far, it looks like they want it. And finally, the, the third argument was uh, that it would be too costly. First, uh, the other sectors are doing it and they are not endowed with more financial resources to do it. Like if you go to philanthropy, they don't have more money than uh, investment funds. So they are doing it. Why finance would not do it first? Second, there, are, there, there is some evidence suggesting that some investors at least would accept to pay more for impact products that do the measurement thing. So perhaps you can transfer to the end clients the uh, super cost associated to the impact measurement. And if it's costly now, it may not be so costly in the future because at some point there will be harmonization of practices. So now it's costly because you have to, to, uh, to spend a lot of brain space into the designing of your methods. But in the future, if, if the world industry is thinking about it, then there will be a kind of, harmonization of resources, of uh, practices, sorry. And you will not have to, to spend the, your brain space on it. You will, have, you will only have to, to, to spend your brain space on applying it, not on designing it, which will make it much cheaper. So to me, this one doesn't hold uh, either. So uh, let's say it's doable. Let's say people want it, and let's say let's say uh, it will not be that costly. So now, how can we do it? So uh, let's go back to the 500 pages book. And what does it say? It say that there it's a challenge to measure uh, investor impact because you have to measure to demonstrate at the same time causality and additionality. So you have to demonstrate that the positive outcome you observe are really due to your actions. First and second, that they would not have occurred otherwise. It sounds to be a, a pretty, pretty bold, uh, pretty ambitious quest to prove that. Second, we, are, we do have a, a, a clear practical problem because there is no planet B. It's not that we have to care for this planet because there is no planet B. I'm saying for evaluation purpose, we have a problem because there is no planet B. So if I'm doing something, I cannot observe what would have happened otherwise because there is no planet B in which I do not do the same action. There is only one planet with only one course of actions. So how can I measure the counterfactual scenario? Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible, but we have to rely on second best options. And that's where the, the nice part is. Evaluation experts 
they have thought so much about how to design a counterfactual, even if there is no planet B. And there are many ways to do that, many ways. In the workshop afterwards, I will explain the different ways. But you have to create a counterfactual. So you have to find out, let's say, a perfect match, someone that looks very like you. And so you will see, let's say, the path of your own decarbonization versus the path of the decarbonization of that other unit that has not been invested, let's say, by a fund. Do you see something different happening for the units that have been treated by the fund that have been invested by the fund? That's the first way to do it. Second way is to design a, a, a relevant comparison group based on some observable factors or non-observable factors. Second option is to create a synthetic clone. So you do not search anymore for someone that looks like you. You recreate that clone by taking a kind of average of different companies. So if you have invested in company A, you create a synthetic clone out of company, companies B, C, D, F, D, based on, because you want to have a perfect match in terms of several attributes. That's another way to do it. And finally, uh, you can use artificial cutoff. Let's say uh, you are a bank's providing loans to see if your green loans, let's say, have a positive impact. You can create an artificial rule like, I will provide green loans only to companies uh, below a certain market cap, let's say, let's say. And then you observe the, let's say the decarbonization pathway for companies above the threshold and be below the threshold because they are very similar, but they are just, one is just one step above the threshold while the other is one step below. So they look very similar and then you can observe the different pathways. So there are many ways to do this. And uh, the evaluation experts are pretty easy with those methods. I'm not super easy with those, but evaluation experts are. Plus there are other methods. Those are the counterfactual methods. They, they use a counterfactual, but they, if it's impossible for any reason to, 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 to find your perfect counterfactual, then you can rely on other methods. There are qualitative methods that try to get evidence out of quantitative materials, qualitative materials. And there are theory-based methods. In that case, you need data to validate the different steps of your theory of change. So even if you are not sure that it's on you, you are the cause of the positive outcomes, if every single step is exactly the same as what you predicted, most probably, you were successful in, de in delivering impact because your whole theory of change is validated, it's, it's valid. And finally, uh, you are not forced to limit yourself to one single method because they are all imperfect in a sense. So uh, another way is just to combine methods that are imperfect. Let's say a very gross quantitative method plus a, a very gross qualitative method, but the Two of them helps to triangulate investor impacts. So uh, this is how it is done in, uh, in other sectors. Most of the time they rely on mixed methods. Uh, so for the quasi-experimental methods that try to create a counterfactual, uh, those are the different ones, very classic ones, I would say. The propensity score matching, the difference in difference, the synthetic control method, the instrument instrumental variable method and the regression discontinuity design. Uh, the graph is for difference in difference. In that case, you will compare your invested companies to companies that had the same trends regarding your impact metrics, let's say uh, carbon emission. They were improving their carbon metrics with the same trend. Let's say every single year, they reduced by 5% their carbon intensity. So that creates a control group for you and then as soon as you start investing into the company, you see if there is a divergence in the trend. If it follows the same trend as before, we conclude that you have no impact. But if we see an acceleration in the trend for your invested companies and not for the control group, then you are attributed a positive impact. Again, it's imperfect. There are some flows to each method, but they can be more or less controlled for. 
So that's a sum up of all methods currently available based on the 500 pages book. And as you can see, uh, the more you move to the uh, left hand side, the stronger your ability to demonstrate causality and additionality. And the maximum, the best proof you can provide is through uh, counterfactual methods. And especially the very famous randomized control trials, the one that has been uh, made famous by uh, Esther Duflo for uh, development aid program. Uh, so you have a variety, a huge variety of methods that are, that are usable. How to pick one of them? It all depends on the context. What data you, you can uh, rely on. Second, the sample size of your portfolio, because some methods, the econometric methods, they rely, they need, they require a lot of data. So if you have a portfolio with only a, a dozens of positions, some econometric methods cannot be applied. So it will force you to move to other methods. And uh, you have to think about confounding factors. What could bias your impact estimation based on what you know about the environment? And there are very typical confounding factors, the selection bias, the spillovers, the secular trend, the interfering events. I can explain the different ones. Selection bias is, for instance, when you may be tempted to select companies that are already on a good path. Or just because you know that the management that has just arrived is a management super concerned by climate issues, for instance. So you invest in that and you will observe a very rapid, let's say decarbonization, but not because of your actions, just because of the management actions. So that's a selection bias. Spillover is uh, when what you're doing is having an effect on other companies and there are positive and negative spillovers. For instance, uh, tomorrow you will see Rob Bauer. Rob Bauer is, uh, was uh, one of the authors of uh, a paper on the positive spillovers of having a director that was involved into uh, a, a climate related proposal during a, an AGM. If a director was uh, in place within a company that was facing such a resolution, he will have a kind of effect on other companies in which is also a director. So there is a spillover effect. When you are an activist targeting one company, you may have indirect effects on other companies. So if my estimation is based on the comparison of the two, it will be flawed. So we have to remove all those spillover effects, whether they are positive or negative. Uh, interfering events is exactly what I said to the arrival of a new manager. If there is a new company man manager that is super uh, climate concerned, it will bias your estimate, for sure. And secular trend, there may be, for instance, an acceleration in the consideration of climate issues, which is what we observe. So if you do a very basic before-after design, like you see uh, your carbon intensity now, and you compare to the carbon intensity uh, two years ago, you could see, oh, there is an improvement. It's on me. No, it's not on you. It's just the whole community is more concerned about climate and all companies are doing decarbonization at a faster pace. So we have to take into account all of this and to choose an adequate method that controls the best for all of them. Uh, so, uh, but it's feasible, it's feasible. I insist there are so many different methods that you, could, you can find one or a combination of them. Uh, there are problems with some uh, with the measurement of collective impact because some impact strategies rely on other people doing the same, like market signaling, for instance. When you want to influence prices in financial markets, you expect other investors to do the same. Let's let's say you are uh, doing uh, exclusion, you are doing exclusion, and you think that if many people are doing exclusion the same way as you, then the prices of excluded companies will fall. And let's say it happens. Let's say it works. How can I measure uh, your own impact through this collective action? I don't know how to attribute your own responsibility within this collective action. And, uh, and there, so there, there are many problems associated with collective impacts. 
uh, there are problems associated to the evaluation of the overall collective impact and then the attribution to each of the, the different single investors within the collective action. So uh, there are a lot of work to, to be done uh, in impact evaluation, especially when we turn to collective impact. So uh, I will end up with a few potential ways forward for product, product manufacturers and for regulators the same way. So for product manufacturers, uh, it's important to engage with your investors because you need data. So uh, even if you have very, very uh, sophisticated evaluation methods, you still need to ground them on data. So you have to engage with your investors so that they can provide the data. And that would be useful for your own evaluation, but also for the, the following impact investors because they could access data. Uh, you have to start evaluating your own investor impact and not stop at the level of investing impact. Uh, you have to choose an adequate uh, evaluation strategy. Uh, you have to choose your strategy before investing because, again, you need the data. You need the appropriate data. So if you do afterwards, you may miss the data. Uh, it's better not to do it on your own because there are experts uh, in town doing this. So just rely on them. And finally, uh, think that if you want to comply with consumer protection law, you have to substantiate your impact claims or like every type of claim. So impact claim is a very bold claim and uh, measurement may be part of the substantiation. For regulators, there are many pending questions. Uh, perhaps it would be fruitful to add an impact product category within the regulation to to match with the clear preferences of a group of investors. In our uh, 2DI surveys, we observed that like 40% of retail investors are more or less interested in having impact. And we, we have like between 15 and 20% that want impact as the first preference over financial return and over aligning with your preference, with their personal preference. It's about having a real impact. Uh, there is a, a very important question. Do we consider investor impact evaluation to be compulsory for every type of impact product? Do we consider, like it was proposed in the consultation paper by the FCA, that it should be part of any impact product? That's a cornerstone that cannot be uh, avoided. That's a discussion. Uh, and if we do so, how to measure impact? What are the acceptable methods? And is it only about measuring or is it also about obtaining out results, positive results? It's good to measure impact, but it's also better to have positive impact, to be sure that you had positive impact. So in that case, what's the minimum level of impact you want to observe? Like impact on 50% of positions, 70% of positions, 90% of positions? So we need minimum thresholds, potentially. So as you may, oh, no, no, it's not the conclusion. Uh, just I wanted to spend one minute saying that currently we're working on a framework at 2DI for assessing the climate impact potential of financial products. And because the industry is currently so bad at measuring impacts, we can't insert measurement results within the framework. So we base our framework only on the potential of the category and the potential of the product to deliver impact and not on the achieved and measured uh, impact. So that's the PT, but so far the industry is not advanced enough to provide those information. So as you understand, there is still a long way to go to uh, make impact very usable for investors. Uh, impact investing is definitely a paradigm shift from traditional finance. Traditional finance was about maximizing the risk return combo. When you do impact, you try to maximize not no more a combo of two elements, but a combo of three, risk, return, impact. So that's a paradigm shift. And uh, we are still far away from being capable to use impact in the same way as we use return and risk, like uh, a very clear metri metric that can be compared across different investment products. We can't do that with impact so far. So 
I think we really need uh, progression and advancement regarding investor impact measurement. Thank you. Okay. Any question? Yeah, please. Oh, there, first of all. Uh, so I am um, very interesting for presentation, first of all, but uh, I would maybe question a bit or challenge one of the, the examples uh, you were giving of uh, impact or actually lack of impact or even use a negative impact, which is uh, this uh, uh, sustainability minded investor investing in uh, the, the IPO of uh, of a um, sustainable company. That yeah, very, yeah, in a popular company that would be uh, invested by other people as well. But uh, the thing, I mean, the way mostly uh, listings work is that uh, uh, there is both a price range, the achievement of which depends on, uh, on, on the popular, on it being sufficiently oversubscribed, there being more interest than uh, there is takers. And there's also very often... Uh, uh, extra provision that uh, if there is a certain level of interest, uh, then there is a extra um, issuance. Uh, issuance. Yes, okay. So in this, uh, in uh, and in both ways, uh, the the so end of substitutions. Yeah, at, and the uh, end effect is that uh, this uh, company, let's say for example, a sustainability uh, energy company, where uh, society desperately needs. Um, needs the, the push and uh, needs more capital, then this company would have more capital to invest uh, quicker and uh, power up quicker their sustainability investments. And this is without uh, coming to the uh, to the in, indirect uh, spillover effects that uh, if uh, if uh, the, this some uh, very successful and very much oversubscribed uh, there will be other uh, issuances, yeah. uh, then it encourages more of the same type of company to look on the uh, look to the capital markets for their funding and uh, and raising the capital they need. Uh, never mind that also even this uh, uh, not sustainability conscious investor who, uh, well, in issuance you're not completely usually pushed out. You just get less than you you you, uh, you indicated. Uh, then uh, this because in an um, event that it, the listing is very oversubscribed, usually the price goes up also as, later as well, which also motivates actually the non-sustainability conscious investor to move or to also participate in the next uh, uh, green energy offering, even if they don't care so much about green energy. So I, I, I struggle to see the, the negative of uh, the sustainable conscious people Oversubscribing a, a listing of a, for example, just as an example of a, of a, I don't know, wind energy company, even if, okay, it's a profitable company and it would get the capital more or less anyway, but maybe not as much. And it's still, I don't know, I, I, I have tr trouble agreeing, let's say, with your. Okay, uh, I agree with you that uh, it works if the volume of uh, capital needed is pretty fixed. If it can be grow, grown, uh, then it's, uh, you're right, it can be additional. I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, but then you say, uh, then it will influence prices, which is also a good thing. Yes, but we can discuss market signaling. Uh, we know that uh, we need to be pretty big to influence prices significantly. So uh, I, uh, I prefer when you say that it will lead to more capital being raised. Then when you say that through the price signal, then it would be also positive for our next issues. Yeah, just to clarify on the, on the price signal, uh, uh, I mean, there I think uh, I, I largely agree that uh, the price signals on the secondary market uh, do not, all, well, they can matter, to, but uh, not as much because there is a, uh, there's also the counterfactual that uh, that uh, if the sustainability-minded investors all sell and get out, then uh, then uh, yeah, so it works at the entrance and at the exit as well. Yeah, exactly. Then uh, then uh, in the end, all the oil companies will be owned by uh, by I don't know the Saudi Arabia and, and whoever and Russia, and then uh, this is not going to necessarily improve. But uh, what I meant is the price signal it sends to the next primary listing that if uh, I agree with you. for similar companies so 
big difference for me, at least, uh, between the, the primary listing and the secondary market okay. in this sense. Uh, my question is about um, where the emphasis is, is on the interest for the investor to be served by an impact uh, evaluation exercise. Um, the question is, when you talk about regulators, they would be happy to see that uh, this process is uh, successful, but they may still have a question about how complete it is. Will the exercise uh, free the investee and to satisfy the investor from the risk of stranding assets over time? And the reason to mention this is that um, in assessing the direct impact and uh, indirect impacts and emissions in a public interest view, there's more going on than being captured by a scope one, two, three, and four. And when it is about consumers, it's about uh, health impacts. And it, that is um, um, a problem we defined under the terms of food systems, uh, in analysis of the U.S. Academy of Science, uh, uh, consumer food data system 2030 and beyond. And one of the first observations is that the current food systems um, lead to uh, cost to society in the order of uh, $1,200 billion per year in the U.S. economy related to what they call non-communicable diseases, obesity, etc. And the poor consumer is also falling victim to this kind of problem. So um, would the um, relevance of a theory of change be helpful enough to incorporate the concept of, uh, let's say, let's call it autonomous change, which we see reflected, and I'll stop, in the analysis of IPCC 6 uh, mitigation, the behavioral change um, contributions to climate mitigation. Which you, Mark. You I have some it. answers to it. I just want to raise it as an issue. Uh, it's true that there are, there are two big limitations to current impact evaluation methods. They mostly care about uh, direct impact only and not indirect impacts. So if there is a, a major price impact that could degrade the financial situation of many people, that should be part of the estimate, I agree, but that's not that's not in there. It's only direct impact. And the second problem is the, the time frame of impacts. Most of the time, impact is delivered many years after the end of your investment. So if you stop your observation at the end of your investment, you are missing the impact, basically. So that's a real problem to solve. I agree, I agree. Uh, but... Perhaps we can work on, I don't know, batch of impact, like impact over the last year, last five years, last 10 years, et cetera. That would, same as we provide re, uh, uh, figures for returns over the different time periods. So perhaps you can get it out thanks to this. But I, I agree with the limitation. I fully agree. Thank you for your insights, for your lecture. I wonder if you uh, ever thought of expanding the scope of this uh, research, or probably there are already uh, work, uh, there is already work available on this, because all the time we talk as if the amount of money is stable, while essentially in the economic, I mean, it is money is created and money is destroyed. Yes. And uh, that would mean that uh, there are probably uh, quite mighty instruments to um, propel the green transition, and that makes uh, this additionality of of capital, of you know all the all the stuff you discussed with uh, with uh, one investor uh, investing, another taking away that money. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, uh, an important topic, but it if put in the context of the let's say money money um, money amount uh, discussion it may become less relevant oh, and really? I, I i remember the 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 um, initiative by some ngos possibly also uh, including some some people here in the room about uh, 
making uh, central bank. Uh, of course, policy, say, green, uh, green monetary policy. So, how how do you how do you yeah. see this in that wider money creation, money destruction? Oh, it's context? it's uh, uh, it's a, a very hot topic within 2DI right now. Uh, it's it's very clear that impact is a micro based way of thinking change. So it's like every single economic agent trying to do better. That is the impact lens. And there are other ways that are probably much more effective to drive change. And they probably they are macro based. So that could be a tax, a carbon tax, that could be a green monetary policy, etc. So to us, there, there should be like two different lenses. One is micro based, let's call it the impact lens, and the other one is a systemic change lens. And uh, I never said that impact is the most, uh, the faster way, the fastest way to, to deliver change. No, and I don't think so. I think macro is better, is, is, is faster. But so far, it's like we don't believe anymore in policy change. So we want to do better at our micro level. And impact is it's, it's like a very individualistic way to answer a problem, I would say. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, when you were talking about collective uh, action, I was my ears perked up because that's always the big problem for us asset managers when it comes to stewardship and saying, well, who, who's responsible? Who's going to take credit for this company action? And I noticed that, you know, you said, oh, it's very complicated. Could you go into any more details? Is there anything that we could take away from the literature? Well, there is a workshop on this. Uh, okay. okay. No, okay. workshop is about uh, yeah measurement, and we will deal a bit with the collective impact measurement. But uh, for for I can yeah, there could be a free rider problem. Definitely, when you are involved into a collective uh, engagement uh, action, I would say. Uh, but maybe a, a, a way to move out the free rider problem is to to do like what is uh, what CA one hundred plus is doing. They distinguish distinguish between leads. Uh, I don't know how they call them, but leads in the uh, engagement action and followers. So and you have some attributed task if you are a lead investor or a follower a follower investor. So perhaps at least we could differentiate between different types of investor within uh, a collective action, I would say. That could be a way forward. But I, I can't say much more, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, for us, not the first time that we're here, but still always uh, a pleasure. Um, but still, Mikael, to um, regarding all these other measure measurement uh, frameworks which exist in in different literatures, what are the limitations there? What can you tell us? Uh, you know, what are the barriers and problems they face in development aid, impact measurement, or philanthropic impact measurement, etc. Uh, a typical problem is uh, to, to, to set, so, so the, uh, yeah, it depends. Uh, the assessment framework could be based on actions only, action processes or action processes and outcomes. And you have limitations at each level. So let's say for actions, the main limitation is to get minimum threshold to say that you are really doing a potentially impactful action. So what's the minimum requirements for doing engagement? What's the minimum requirements for providing flexible capital? Is it minus 1% versus market terms or minus 3%? We don't know so far. So that's for the actions. Uh, for the measurements, as I said before, there is so far nothing to measure. So uh, it's very complex. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, I can I can talk a bit about the what has been done in Paris and it should be published today, actually. So uh, I was co-piloting uh, an evaluation grid of the impact potential of products, and the approach that was used 
was to uh, design a list of 35 questions that were dealing with uh, intentions, actions, monitoring processes, and observation of outcomes. And you get points for each of them. And you, you finally end up with a total score that gives you your total impact potential score, I would say. So that's an approach that makes every stuff, I would say. But uh, it's, it's more art than science, I have to admit. Because for each of them, uh, it's very hard to, 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 to tell what should be giving you a one score, a, a one point or two point or three points. Because there is no standards within the industry to say uh, if it's a, a, an effective engagement, a very effective engagement or a very, very effective engagement policy. So, so far it was uh, a bit arbitra arbitrary, I would say. So the, the literature is not um, clear enough about the minimum thresholds to set. That's, that's a, a very, very uh, problem, topical problem so far. Hi, thank you for the interesting presentation, Jan from uh, UNPRI. Um, I have a question about the regulators. So in your slide, you, you focused on specific impact funds and how that can potentially be regulated. Have you thought about how you can create the um, idea of impact more broadly um, into regulation? For instance, kind of uh, pinpointing in regulation that there is a difference between the impact of the invest, investee and the investor across uh, regulations, for instance, I mean, working on EU policy, but, but generally. So it's a very hot topic within the team at 2DI. Uh, there are different ways to address the issue. Uh, we can be very strict on the definition of impact. In that case, we say investor impact measurement is part of it, end of the story. Or we can be more, um, how can I say, uh, practical uh, and say, uh, perhaps there is, there, there is a way for two different types of impact related products. One that do measure and ones that don't measure. And you just have to, to, to first to call them differently because as you saw during the panel, there were two people saying they were having impact, impact investing funds, but they were doing very different stuff, a very different approach. So it's like we use the same word for very different approach. So per, perhaps we need to define several impact related categories with different minimum requirements. And the one, let's say light impact category with, without any uh, impact investor impact measurement, uh, there should be a disclaimer there saying, that product has a clear intention to deliver impacts, is definitely doing stuff to deliver impacts, but we cannot be sure it delivers impacts because it doesn't measure impacts. That would be a necessary disclaimer for that kind of product, but there would be another disclaimer as well for the other category of product because the best you can have is estimate of the past impact. But the same way as for financial performance, your impact performance of the past doesn't foresee your future impact performance. So there would be another disclaimer as well. So we are thinking about it, but we, yeah, we have strategic discussions about how to move forward. Yeah, so to answer your question in one sentence uh, yes we 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 advocate a lot uh, for for this that uh, impact is becoming part uh, of the regulation or will be integrated in the, the definition of investor impact to be more precise um, so it has potential huge impact on product disclosure and also distribution and at the moment it's completely lacking in the regulatory framework so we have published two legal papers on this uh, recently. I can recommend to read them uh, where we yeah, highlight uh, this recommendation. And if you do a light impact, you have to change all your marketing claims. So it's no more about impact. It could be about something else, like contribution to a collective change, but not impact because impact is micro-based. So it's your own impact, not the impact of everybody doing the same thing as you. Or for some people, it's even worse. It's not everybody doing the same as you. It's hypothetically. 
what would happen if everybody was doing the same as you? Then for sure, the, there will be a price changes in the market. If everybody is moving towards green investment and giving up on uh, brown investments, but it's completely hypothetical. So that's very different to the impact way of thinking. So if the regulator is going to different types of uh, categories, the impact claims, the claims would have to be very different. Are you planning to apply the methodology in which you have been working uh, from some uh, fund managers, investor? Oh, investor. we will apply. Uh, uh, so, but uh, as I said, as I started to say during the, the, the workshop in, in the morning, uh, we can apply the methodology based on the marketing documents provided by the fund. So uh, based on what the, the information we have, we can rate the product. So that would be done. He, he, that will be done in the, let's say, the very first quarter of 2023. Because for me, one of the limitation is that uh, in the practical way, uh, always the question inside of the fund managers, uh, um, impact investor is, uh, but is the, the measure the impact in scientific and academic way is not our the core of our business. Yes. And that implies a lot of work, a lot of effort, and some of us, are doing the best uh, to measure the impact, I think, in, in different kind of ways and methodologies. And we try to apply it our methodology. So that, that seems like a lot of work. So for me, it's that like a limitation when we think uh, um, about uh, a standardized methodology that implies a lot of work as you are doing guys uh, behind the 2D II. So it's impossible for the, the other fund managers that if you arrive to have this methodology and discuss with, with us, the, the, the fund managers, the, invest, the impact investors, maybe we can do a very inter interesting synergies to, to try to apply yes. what uh, you are doing and, and learning. And That's clearly the end game because so, uh, so far there is a kind of proliferation of methods. Everybody is doing its own methods, which are not very scientific. And still, they, they devote a lot of energy into it. And that's probably a loss of resources. So uh, the end of the journey is definitely to have a kind of a harmonized methods that can be practically applied by the industry. So it has to be done uh, with the interconnection of expert, evaluation experts and the industry. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. I hope it will uh, occur. Yes.